It would have been better to call this the Intervention Committee, for the whole activity of its members consisted in explaining or concealing the participation of their countries in Spain. Good morning to everyone, I'm Pep and this is the Spanish Civil War in this channel and for the next three years we will follow week by week the Spanish Civil War, its battles and the Holocaust that it provoked. We will start the week in the international stage again. I think by the introductory sentence of Mr. Ribbentrop and the episode title you can figure out what we are going to talk about. But let's introduce it with another quote, that one from Pandit Nero that considered the non-intervention committee the supreme farce of our era. The 9th of September, this committee held its first meeting in London. I could end it there, even skipping all the committee's meetings because it did nothing, at least nothing related to its name. Well, here you have the list of all the countries that sing the pact. But of course, we have to talk about it the Non-Intervention Committee was a clear example of the appeasement towards the fascist regimes merged with the conservative spirit of the British elite that despised the average worker and was afraid of the investments they had in Spain. During the first days of the war, the British military even allowed the rebels use their communications in Gibraltar. Everyone in the committee had the evidence of the Italian bombers that fell into French territory and later the Commission will not accept Republican Spain evidence of foreign intervention because Spain was not a member of the Commission. And you may ask, and what about Russia and Uncle Joseph? Well, Russia started to send military advisors to Spain last week and was waiting and observing they didn't want to get the French angry, they would start shipping material to Spain later. After it seemed clear, the committee would not stop German and Italian intervention and that the European democracies were not eager to help Spain. This Russian intervention, as we will see in the future, will make the communists gain more power inside the political ground of the Republic. Keep in mind that until the arrival of Russian help, Communists were a minority in Spain and authoritarian communists, Stalinists, even more. But here we've got one of the main paradoxes of the Spanish Civil War, or at least of its narrative. A coup that allegedly wanted to prevent communism in Spain threw the Republic in the arms of Stalin as the European democracies turned their backs at her. I think we could find more examples in history where people especially Spangler's fans that thought that civilization needed a firing squad to be saved through theirs or others countries into the hands of what they wanted to avoid. Well, after this huge introduction, we should go back to the fray. This week, the Galician columns reached the zone near the rivers Narsena and Nalon, where we left them the other week. The Republicans tried to use the rivers as the last natural defensive line before the besieged city of Oviedo. During the week, the Republic will organize a counterattack against Salas in order to stabilize the front. And it will be partially a shift, at least in the northern flank, because in the south, the 11th, the rebels take Cornellana and cross the Narsena in an 8 km wide front. They have to reach Cabruñana, but are stopped there by the militias. Since the end of August, the first fast advances the rebels had made in that front were stopped. Right now, and until the end of the campaign, the rebels will fight village after village and will march at a speed of 700 meters per day. 700 meters that will be paid in blood. Also in the north, but on the Basque front, the fall of Irun resulted in a blow for the Republic, but the rebels don't wait to continue their advance. At the end of the week, they reach San Sebastián. Without fight, the city falls into their hands. 
The past leaders didn't want the city to suffer the same fate as Irun, so they evacuated. As once were leaving, people started to come out from their houses to welcome their liberators. This image will be seen everywhere in Spain as soon as a village changed hands. The supporters of the liberating side will emerge from their hideouts. The rebel troops that were advancing from the south of Scaleria reached Arnieta last week, but they had to retreat because of intense Republican fire. They also tried to take Hernani by force, but failed. This week we'll see how the Republicans counterattacked in order to take Mount Esteneaga, but were repelled. Meanwhile, the 9th, the rebels started to move their troops to the east for Nani, as their plan is to take the force that defend the city from the east and then fall upon it. After the fall of Talavera that we covered last week, during this week some Republican counterattacks will fail to retake the city. The rebels had overextended, in fact, by taking the city, so now they have to regroup and prepare to make their next move. But as happens with the Galician columns, their advance is becoming slower and harder day by day, as the Republican defenses are strengthening themselves. Also near the capital, but in the north, we saw at the middle of August how the rebels launched an attack in order to capture Siguenza, and how the attack failed. Since this week, the city will be under sporadic but systematic artillery fire from the rebel positions in Mojares, marking the start of the battle for Siguenza. We'll follow it during the next weeks. On the Republican side, after the retreat from Mallorca, some reinforcements were sent to Ibiza in order to bust the island defenses. As said last week, the new Republican government created the 5th of September a general staff. Following that decision, the 11th, it will reorganize the militias as part of a regular army and will change the name of the General Inspectorate of Militias to Military Command of Militias. We may see here how Largo struggled since the beginning to militarize the militias. After this first month of war, it seemed clear to everybody that you couldn't turn a civilian into a soldier just by giving him a rifle. Since the beginning of the war, apart from the discipline problems, those columns of militiamen had shown lack of organization and standardization. Even if some professional staff was assigned to them, they lacked quartermasters and according to Beaver, some units had up to 16 different types of ammunition. A logistical nightmare. To make things even worse, the international blockade meant that the Republic had to rely on their own limited production and the black market, as it lacked almost everything. As different committees tried to buy weapons abroad, prices got higher. It even happened that Republican delegates bid against each other for weapons. According to a rebel witness, during this month's advance towards Toledo, they will capture ammunition produced just a couple of days earlier in the Toledo weapons factory. On the north, in an excavation at Pico Paisano, in the Asturian front, they found that just one of every six identified coverages were home produced, and even if most of them were Mexican, there were also Polish, French, Austrian, a Czech's coverage. A mess if we compare it to the more standardized and immediate help the rebels were receiving. It seemed clearly that the Republic was doomed. Even if the regime narrative says that the publicity war was won by the Republic, during these first crucial months of war, this was not the case. As said before, most of the people who managed to fly or were already aboard were wealthy enemies of the Republic. The fact that the Republicans held two major cities and the rebels advanced through small villages focused the international press and diplomats on the atrocities on the Republican territory. It won't be until Guernica bombardment that the Republic will have the upper hand in the propaganda war. But it will be too late. So, if you want to know what will happen, keep tuned. 
Because that's all for this week, folks. As always, if you missed last week's episode, here's the link. And please, don't forget to like the video and subscribe us. If you enjoyed it, share it. We have to bring light to the history of Spain. If you are able to support us in our Patreon channel, as these heroes already did, or offer us a coffee, this could also be great and would help us to carry on and improve the project. Let's make this possible together. Thanks for your attention, goodbye and salute.